Mm. All right, is the mic working okay? All right, good. Um, thank you, Thomas, uh, very much for that uh, introduction. Um, it's kind of, it's nice to be back here at U of M. I've been coming back uh, now for the last um, six or seven years, um, maybe eight years even now, uh, since I opened up the, the first um, Barracuda office um, here in Ann Arbor. Um, I kind of, I started as an entrepreneur um, actually when I was in high school, a um, long, long time ago. Um, but I came to college and, and, and university and um, kind of gave it up uh, for four or five years. I went to work for Apple for a few years out of school and I worked for some startups in Silicon Valley. Um, and then I started my own companies. Um, and so I've been labeled as a serial entrepreneur. Um, I actually like to label parallel entrepreneur now uh, since I tend to kind of get a few too many things going. Um, but uh, the, latest, um, the latest company I'm starting is Eagle Eye Networks. It's doing video surveillance. Um, the last company I did before this um, was um, I started two companies, um, Barracuda Networks and another company called IC Manage. Um, Barracuda Networks has grown to be very successful. It's got a nice office here in Ann Arbor. Um, we took it public on the New York Stock Exchange last year. Um, and IC Manage is a company that does software for semiconductor design. Um, the software that IC Manage may, uh, delivers is used by almost every uh, chip manufacturer in the world to design the chips that go in all of your computers and phones. Um, when I was asked to speak at this class um, by David, um, he, 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 he gave me a question of is, you know, let's talk about what trends and what's hot in global technology and, you know, how do you turn that into a money-making business? How do you turn that into a company? Um, and so I kind of, I thought about that a little bit and, and I wrote down kind of five or six things that were, um, I thought kind of interesting or, or hot in global technology. And then like anyone who's uh, reasonably intelligent, um, I went and typed that question into Google and uh, thought I'd figure out what the rest of the world had to say about what was hot in global technology. And um, the very first thing that came up, the very top of my Google search, when I said, what is hot in global tech? You're not gonna believe what it was. Anybody got a guess? It says, report, colon, Michigan could be hot spot for global talent. <laughs> okay, um, this is not what I expected on that uh, particular Google search, but uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was fortuitous. Um, so I looked at kind of what other people had said in global tech, and it didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, okay? Um, you know, the Forbes article said that it was gonna be the smart home privacy backlash. We we're gonna have advertising and everything. We were gonna have 4K content, okay? Cloud wars and uh, social media were gonna be the, the, the hot trends in global tech. And then they, they interviewed a bunch of VCs on another article and said that the business apps will be reinvented. There's gonna be digital disintermediation of the banks, the smart home, health insurance is gonna get revolutionized. There's gonna be cyber attacks on the home, and there's gonna be a female founder who has an exit greater than $50 billion. And I was like, none of those really sound like global tech trends to me. Those are not technology trends in, in my world, right? I think about it very differently. I think about it a little bit more like an engineer, but I also think about it a little bit more at a foundational level, okay? To me, all of those tech trends are the applications of technology to a business, okay? They are not technology trends, okay? A technology trend, to me, is something that's an underlying kind of foundational thing that's changing or now available or evolving that should be applied or can be applied to a business problem. You guys just got a little video about the problem. The problem is really important, okay? Framing the problem, understanding the problem, and attacking a real problem is what makes a successful business, okay? I often give people a little anecdote um, of that in your, when you're selling a product, okay, you want to sell a painkiller not a vitamin, okay? 
it is much easier to sell a painkiller than it is to sell vitamins. Somebody's got a headache, okay, they got real pain, they will pay real money quickly to you for a solution to that pain. If you show up and kind of say, oh, I got a vitamin, right, the benefits of the vitamin, you know, when am I going to get those benefits, how quickly am I going to be get those benefits, will I ever get those benefits, it's a much harder sale. And so if you can define a problem, you are one step uh, up um, relative to getting your company launched. So when I thought about tech trends, the tech trends that I wrote down were, were very engineering um, in many ways. You know, the first one I wrote down was, I still think we're in the midst of a mobile revolution, and that basically, what does that mean? Okay, that doesn't mean mobile phones. That means using mobile technology, i.e., the ability to get information or data wherever you are, whenever you are, however you want, okay, allows you to actually revolutionize and change certain problems or industries. Cloud, you know, cloud, cloud, cloud. Everybody talks about the cloud. What is the cloud really? Okay, the cloud is really about offloading, okay, stuff that companies used to have to do in their own IT department to a set of professionals who are basically in another location who take care of it on a larger scale and do it a lot better than the three or four guys in the back room could do, okay? It's about basically economies of scale. It's basically, you know, uh, you know uh, capitalism at work, specialization. I mean, that's what really is the underlying premise of the cloud. There's a lot of technology to make that happen, okay? And that technology has evolved kind of over the last 10 years such that you can now apply it to a lot of industries that didn't necessarily think about it before. Um, the third one that I wrote down was software as a service, which is basically kind of um, an evolution of the cloud or a beginning of the cloud. And that's basically taking software, which used to be highly distributed and run on hundreds and hundreds of separate computers by hundreds and hundreds of separate people, email servers, for example, um, and basically concentrating them so that one person's running it and they're doing it better. Um, one of the things I always look at, um, and this is kind of very uh, slightly geeky, as to the trends in um, technology is what's going on in the open source software community. Okay, how many of you guys know what open source software is? Okay, all right, half. Um, so, Open source software is, is basically the development of software that people basically publish on the internet and whole groups of people assemble and just work on it, mostly as a hobby, sometimes as a job, sometimes your company pays them to work on it. But it's basically software that's freely available. Because it's freely available, it's freely discussed, right? There's a lot of information and people want to work on, they get to choose what they, they want to work on. So they work on what's hot, okay? And so if you look at the trends in open source software, you can get a, a lot of insights into what the new technologies are that might be available to apply to problems, okay? If you look at the open source software technology transition over the last 10 years, okay, 10 years ago, open source software was all about developing an application that ran on one computer, okay? So, you might, you know, an open source word processor, an open source, you know, spam filter, an open source, you know, email handler, an open source web filter, um, open source, you know, CRM system, an open source, you know, tool for this, a graphics package. But it was all software that you would kind of download on one computer and kind of run on that computer to solve the problem that you were trying to solve. If you look at the open source community today, okay, Every project that is hot, that's getting a lot of attention and moving forward in a significant way is all about software that you kind of got to have like 15 or 20 computers to even start to use, okay? It's basically software that's designed to solve these larger problems like, you know, I want to run Facebook or do a Facebook-like product. It's going to have millions of users. How do I do a database? How do I do a queuing engine? How do I do this? How do I do that? All the open source software projects are about basically using large numbers of computers in concentration, okay, to basically provide a service. And so if you look at that, there is a ton of technology in there, 
And the question is, is how do you apply that technology to problems that, you work, um, that an industry is facing? Some of the other kind of technology areas that I think are really hot, I think there's going to be a lot going on in robotics and drones, okay? Um, I'm having a, 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 a tremendous time thinking about different applications of how to use drones, smart drones, self-flying drones, etc. I think there's also going to be a whole lot of revolution that goes on in, uh, brought to us by the 3D printing industry. And I think, I think 3D printing is kind of underselling the whole industry. I think it's, it's 3D, 3D modeling and then creation of parts. I was fortunate enough to be able to go down and, and get a tour of SpaceX um, from Elon Musk a few weeks ago. And they're actually making parts using effectively really advanced 3D printing, just commercial machines they buy um, that do something called sintering, um, which is basically effectively 3D printing with a laser. But they can actually manufacture parts out of, out of um, metals that um, are 98% strength of, of a casting and are so intricate and so complicated that you could never cast them, you could never machine them, you could never possibly uh, manufacture them before this technology was invented. And that's pretty amazing because that's going to enable a whole lot of new things to be done in the auto industry, in the space industry, in the consumer industry as that technology becomes more and more used. And so I just think that there's a big technology trends and the key is how do you apply these technology trends to a problem, okay? How, what problem do you want to solve? Um, so let's kind of talk about some examples of how these technologies solve problems, okay? How many of you have actually ridden in an Uber or know what an Uber is, right? Wow, that's amazing. Um, I love Uber, great. It has it is, it is turned the taxi cab business upside down it was a business that needed to be turned upside down. I don't think it had a technology advance in God knows how long. Okay, it basically um, survives giving relatively poor service in dirty cabs that stink, um, and it needed it needed a change. But Uber didn't really come up with any crazy new technology, right? All they did, and it was brilliant. Okay was use mobile accessibility and a GPS, okay, to basically turn an entire industry upside down. And that is an application of a core technology, okay, i.e. accessibility, mobility, mobile, mobile web, mobile net network, whatever you want to call it. Okay, if you take a look at another example, you know, that's, it was kind of near and dear to my heart, um, in 2003, when I started Barracuda Networks, okay, um, you know, I got I to gotta give you guys a little context because back in 2003, spam kind of basically went from zero to 100 miles an hour in the course of about two years, okay? There was no such thing as spam and email, and then all of a sudden, boom, half of your inbox, three quarters of your inbox was full of spam. Um, but also about that time, Computers started coming down in price. You know, computers were pretty expensive, but they started to get pretty cheap. It was like about 500 bucks, 400 bucks, you could actually get, you know, kind of a bare bones computer. And the software industry was used to selling software, and the software was like two, three, four, five thousand bucks, okay, um, for business kind of related software. And what a customer would do is they would buy the software, they'd buy the OS. Okay, they get the disc, the CDs from the OS manufacturer, do the shuffle, install, click, 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 enter key codes, click, 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 let it grind. 45 minutes, an hour later, you know, the OS would be installed. Then they'd stick in the CD for the software they bought and grind on that. And basically, you know, a day later, they might have the install, the software install working. Oh, and, now, and then you gotta go press update, 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 reboot, reboot, update, update, reboot, okay. <clears throat> And, um, and I kind of I saw this, 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 this obvious thing that I'm selling this software for two, three thousand dollars. Why am I giving my customer all of this pain? Okay, 
on their $400 computer to install the software. I should just ship them a free computer with the software. Okay? And the concept of the appliance, as it's now known, was kind of born. And that was basically, it's a, it's a pre-configured computer with the software on it all ready to go in such a way that you can't actually screw it up. Okay? But it was, it was kind of, you know, a gradual kind of change, right? When computers were two or three thousand dollars, it didn't really make any sense, right? It didn't work. But as the prices came and came down, 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 it kind of snuck up on me or everyone, or, or you know, maybe I was just insightful. But you kind of go, well, this is silly. Why, why am I, why am I making my customer have all this pain when um, the prices drop so far? Okay. And so it's not necessarily the invention of new technology. It's the application of an existing piece of technology, okay, and just packaging it up differently. If you take um, and the, another example, right, um, that I always like to give uh, in terms of how do you take technology and apply it to a market, um, if you take, you know, Google search, okay, um, there were lots of search engines before Google. Okay, um, there were lots of people doing massively parallel kinds of computing um, before Google. Okay, Google said, hey, let's take this massively parallel technology that lots of people are doing and let's apply it to search. Okay, because we can do a better search engine using it. Okay, and as you saw, that was pretty successful. Um, if you take a case of, of PayPal, right? What was PayPal's technology? Okay. They basically kind of said, you know, hey, let's take email. Um, they originally started saying, hey, let's take mobile. That didn't work so good. But then they shifted and said, hey, let's take email. Um, and let's use email as a technology to basically enable payments. Okay. And so this, this concept, because the problem is, is that, you know, payments is too hard, especially overseas and especially internationally, especially between people. So, you can take technology and solve a problem. That's the key to kind of getting basically going. The challenge is, okay, to picking your problem, okay, are relatively straightforward. There's like a handful of them that apply to the business, right? The first is timing, right? If you're too early or you're too late, you miss the window, okay? A lot of things have been too early and kind of fail miserably, okay? If you're too late, someone else is going to beat you to the punch. For those of you who know, you know, Uber and Lyft are in this, like, really crazy war right now, okay? And it's about speed, 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 right? Because he who gets there first. So, you know, Uber is busy opening offices in, in countries and, and cities around the world that I've actually never even heard of. Okay, um, in order to basically win the race. Um, so timing is one thing. The market need, or not always need, but market acceptance is kind of one of the other factors. If you do something and nobody cares, you're not gonna be able to make any money doing it. And in many businesses, it's the ability to design it and build it. Okay, can you actually make it? And this is where the technology piece comes in. Is the technology available to create the solution that you think will solve the problem exist? And in some businesses, there's also the ability to manufacture it at a reasonable cost. Okay, that doesn't apply to a lot of internet businesses, um, but in more traditional businesses, it's the um, ability to manufacture it at a reasonable cost. And then the last piece is can you distribute it to the market? Okay, how do you reach the market? How do you basically get market awareness? How do you deliver the product? Okay, and if you can solve those problems, okay, around your problem, then you can deliver and use that technology or use those major technology trends to deliver your product. Okay, so um, one of the other, the last things, um, that I'd like to comment on is that oftentimes <clears throat> the, 
the execution of other folks in a particular industry is actually pretty poor, okay? The number of people who can actually deliver really great products to the market is actually very few, okay? Or very many, depending on how you, on you look at it. But there's often this huge opportunity where people can have some insight and basically do something that already exists, but just do it so much better that it's actually a significant game changer. You know, and there's, there's many, many examples of that. Uber is almost one of them. You know, the taxi business was there, it was doing fine, but it's like, holy cow, we could do this so much better. Um, another one is, you know, uh, Tesla with the electric car, right? Uh, kind of near and dear to us here in Detroit. Um, what, did, they, did they invent the car? No. But they just said, you know, look, no one's really done the electric car right. Okay, so let's just, let's just do it and do it really well. And if you look at it, there's a lot of amazing things that they did in that car. You know, touch screen, interactive, controls, remotes, et cetera, et cetera. Tons of things that are being copied now, but they just did it a lot better. You know, the original iPhone, okay, wasn't the first smartphone, wasn't the first, you know, phone, wasn't the first uh, touch screen device, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There have been hundreds before it. But it was done really well, such that when you, you got it and you used it, you just go, oh my God, this is, this is a lot better. If you can do that to an industry, you can actually have huge impact. And that is not about inventing new technology. That's about using um, existing technology. Um, the company that I'm basically doing now is, um, is called Eagle Eye Networks. And Eagle Eye Networks is basically taking existing technology this cloud infrastructure technology, this mass computing technology, and we're applying it to um, video cameras. So we're collecting all the video cameras and basically um, tying them all into big cloud servers where we're recording it all in the cloud. The traditional industry is still basically doing recording on site, where they basically have a computer or a DVR on site and they hook all the cameras up to it and record it. We're saying, wow, that's really antiquated in uh, the 21st century and what, we're really, what you really want to go do is basically get this data into the cloud so you don't have to worry about it. You know, Many, many industries have gone to, to basically remote data center cloud storage, and um, we're going to basically go do that with Eagle Eye Networks. Um, so that's a little bit of my view on uh, kind of technology trends. I'd like to open it up for questions um, at this point. Hopefully you guys have some good ones. And I think there's some students that are going to run around with microphones. Hi, sorry, I'm all the way in the back. But um, I remember, so in terms of using examples about people who like were trying to solve a problem with technology, you brought up PayPal, which I use, and I also have Venmo, which is like kind of trying to solve a similar problem, um, except using kind of credit cards, transferring money directly. Um, so I was just curious, like, based on your perspective, which one you thought was a more effective approach to, like, solving the problem of payments and why? Um, okay, so if I, I, I'm not sure I quite got that question. PayPal and what was the other one? Demo. Memo. Yeah, um, I'm not familiar with Memo, uh, so I'm not sure I can really answer the question. Uh, the question was basically is, is which one's more effective, PayPal or Memo? Um, the, but the question, the reality is is that, um, you know, that's a personal, be my personal opinion, which would be interesting. I think that they'll probably end up with different portions of the market, right? One of the things that's interesting and I think was articulated well in the video that you guys watched was, you know, yeah, there's problems, okay? And you can kind of say, oh, you know, I want to solve the problem of payments, okay? Making payments too hard. Well, you got to slice it and dice it, okay, um, down. Well, who's, you know, making a payment to my buddy is too hard, making a payment at the grocery store is too hard, making a payment getting my coffee is too hard, making a payment to, you know, pay my Comcast or my cable bill is too hard, okay? Different answers and different solutions might um, basically work in any of those different areas. My big problem is making payments to, you know, suppliers or friends in, you know, China and Japan. Okay, and that's a different problem than paying at Starbucks. 
Okay, and you know different answers um, will be will, will be required for those, and potentially different companies will come to solve those problems. Over time, those companies may merge and give you one cohesive answer, but that takes a lot of time. We'll get you next. You talked about uh, the open source community trying to address problems in computers, sort of working together. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit? I didn't understand what the pain was that you said Facebook. Like, what are, what are the, those companies? What's the pain they're experiencing that those open source communities are trying to address? Well, I don't think the open source communities are trying to address the pain of Facebook necessarily. Um, but if you if you if there has been a, a mega change that has gone on kind of in conjunction with the invention of the web, okay. Um, in technology that I don't think many people have kind of put their their finger on uh, very accurately. So it was all great, you know, when I when I basically um, launched Facebook or when somebody launched Facebook, um, you know, they put up one web server, okay, with one database server behind it, okay, and that's all great, okay, but once you get to the place where one computer can't handle it, what do you do? Okay, well, then you gotta figure out how to put it on two computers, and then you gotta figure out how to put it on four computers, and you gotta figure out how to put it on a thousand computers, and then you gotta figure out how to put it on 10,000 and then 100,000. Okay, well, the architectural problem of that software from one computer to 10,000 computers is completely different, okay? There is nothing that you can really reuse between the first design and, and the last design. And so the problems you encounter in trying to scale something that large with using a large number of computers are very complicated, okay? Because at the same time, you also wanna make the system robust enough that if one computer breaks, it auto adapts and auto heals and all kinds of, of, kinds of things. So in attacking those problems, queuing systems is one of the big things that's kind of come up out of that world, a lot of technology has been created around queuing systems so that those computers can all talk to each other. There's a whole lot of robust and reliability. But then, after you even get kind of the system working, there's a whole set of management tools that you need to basically know which computers are down, which ones have broken, what you need to do to fix. A whole bunch of monitoring tools that you need to basically understand, okay, oh, these computers are getting overloaded, we need to get some new ones and expand that portion of the network because, you know, something's we're getting more people over here than, than we're, we're set up for. Um, databases, you know, basically have been reinvented in the last 10 years, you know. Before, everything was done with SQL databases and, in, and now, basically, there's this whole set of, of compute that's all around what, what are referred to as no SQL databases, just to be anti. <clears throat> so there's this trend of, you know, large-scale, multi-computer computing, which has really changed. Okay, right here. Yeah, yeah, fine. Um, uh, you spoke about um, like digital manufacturing techniques like ro with robotics, you talked about the sintering, and those kinds of technologies are already pretty prevalent in the automotive industry, aerospace industry, and I'm just wondering, in, in from the field I come from, people are starting to try and integrate these things into building homes and building buildings. And I'm curious if you've seen any, uh, anybody working towards that goal and if you think that's even realistic or makes sense. I mean, because the way we've been building buildings has, or constructing buildings has sort of been in the same paradigm for a very long time. So it is a place where maybe there is some, some opportunity for upheaval or, um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. I, I think that the, um Evolution of manufacturing technology is going to affect every industry. Um, you know, the ones the ones that are affected least or latest are the ones that are most uh, cost sensitive. Um, and so, uh, you know, home building and, and housing and stuff is pretty cost sensitive. A little less cost sensitive than aerospace um, and medical devices. And so, you're going to see new technologies deployed in industries with much higher price points and less. less price sensitivity first, and then it'll evolve as the technology gets lower in price into other industries. And that's the timing piece, right? 
You know, so I can go and do centering using a million dollar machine in the aerospace industry, okay, where it takes me, you know, 24 hours to make one part, okay, but I'm not making a whole lot of parts and I can make this part that otherwise I couldn't make. Can I do that in the auto industry? Probably not yet, okay? There may be applications for it in the auto industry, but the cost of the technology is still too high to apply widely into that industry. Can I do it in medical devices? I might be able to, right? But can I go and do it in homes? Not yet, no. The cost of the technology has got to come way down before I can start to apply it into an industry like that. And so the, the trick is, is, this gets back to the part I was talking about, is can you make it and can you make it cost effectively? In timing, timing, timing. Okay, we've got lots of questions now. Okay, we've got to get our microphone guys to move faster. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, do you think that academia and research at universities is a good indicator for technology trends? Um, wow. Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't claim to be an expert to answer that question, but, you know, I think the professors actually stay pretty plugged into the industry. Um, a lot of the money that they, they actually um, use for the research and, and sponsoring students comes from industry. And so I think that a lot of the problems they're attacking are kind of industry-related problems. I find that they are usually way out in front, though, from kind of what I'll call productization. So they're more in what I'll call the research phase, not the development phase. And the development phase is where you can actually kind of build a company and launch something to actually make money. Um, and so I think they're very plugged in. I think they're just usually way ahead. Next. Um, so this is just like, I guess, a thought process question. When you're, when you're addressing a problem to solve or you're even looking for a problem that you want to solve, um, do you look at the trends in the technoscape, like in technoscapes first, and then um, find a problem like through the trends, or do you just go off on a tangent and think of something completely different to solve? So, I, um, do you, do you, the question is, is do you, do you, are you a problem looking for a solution or a solution looking for a problem? Um, to paraphrase, um, the, you are much better off being a problem looking for a solution than you are a solution looking for a problem, okay? Find the problem that you want to solve. Find somebody who has pain, okay? And then try and find the solution, okay? If you find the solution and then you're trying to find the problem, way too many companies fail miserably. Way too many entrepreneurs fail miserably because they get attached to a piece of technology or a solution, okay? Um, I had a friend of mine who was enamored with smart, smart cards? Smart cards? Smart cards, little, the little credit cards that had little chips in them. I think they were called smart cards. And spent literally five years trying to find a, a, a problem to solve with them, and in the end, gave up, okay? It was great technology, it was really cool, but you know, there just wasn't any problem that anyone was really willing to, to use it to solve for, where the price points and the, all, all that stuff worked. Find a problem and then try and find the solution using technology. You're much better off. Um, Next. Go. Uh, so you spoke about open source software, but things like Oculus Rift, where they start out as an open source community and then end up getting bought out by larger companies. Um, what do you say to that? Because a lot of, like I said, once uh, software is proven to be so good that it could be profitable, it's then usually implemented in a manner that is closed source. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm, I can get, I'm, I'm, I'm very enamored and um, I believe the open source software community has actually greatly enhanced the world, okay? Um, you know, if you look at, at the internet and what we do there, um, without Linux and without Apache, which are two of the biggest open source projects, you know, a lot of what we have on the internet would, would not exist today. Um, but, you know, open source 
software or claiming to be open source software um, has been leveraged and utilized by a lot of commercial efforts. Um, what I was talking about was basically watching what's going on in the open source software to see what kind of some of the technology underpinning trends were, um, which I think is a little bit different than the question um, that you're asking. Um, it's not a bad thing for um, software to necessarily, open source software to be commercialized or utilized in a commercial kind of fashion. It does hurt, um, it does hurt the world, okay, because in many ways it slows down or stops the further evolution of that. Um, but it still indicates that there's a trend and an interest there. So, you know, one of the most famous kind of um, databases was known as MySQL, right? Very, very popular, very, very successful. They um, kind of took a commercial, okay, adding support, adding, you know, a bunch of things, but still keeping it, um, still keeping a piece of it open source. And I think that was actually very effective and very good. Um, MySQL was then bought by Sun and then bought by um, Oracle. And I think that that's had a very different uh, turn of events for MySQL. Fortunately, we have Postgres SQL um, to kind of pick up the, pick up the slack. Um, the interesting thing about it is when one of those projects gets kind of co-opted or commercialized, um, often a new project or an offshoot of that project will spin up um, in the open source community. Yeah. And so, you know, open source isn't a cure-all. It isn't the, you know, isn't everything to everybody. And for a lot of people, it doesn't work. Um, but for a lot of stuff, it does work. But it is, I believe, um, very useful to watch what's going on in that world because in the open source world, people get to work on whatever they want to work on. And people want to work on what's hot, what's exciting, what's changing, and what's new, and, um, and what's going to have impact. And so by looking at that, you can get a good insight into a lot of the trends of what's going on. OK. Anybody? One last question. One last question. Right here. Yeah, One last right question. Here. Right here. <clears throat> What are your thoughts on net neutrality? On, on what? Like uh, net neutrality and the arguments going on with FCC, right? Oh, I, I think um, I'm, a, I'm a pretty strong believer in net neutrality. Um, I think that um, we should take some positions on net neutrality. I'm scared to death that you know, things could get a little squirrely um, uh, in the world if, if we don't maintain that in the United States. Um, you know, I think we got to be cautious and careful about how we do it, but um, I think that there is um, a little bit of a, uh, I think that it's getting attention, and I think that given the attention that it's been given and the awareness that's been created around it, um, I think we're actually in a reasonable place such that um, no one's really going to try and do anything that I think is too um, subversive or too over the top right now because I think the, the backlash, they fear the backlash. Um, but I think it would be a good thing to um, establish um, some thoughtful rules on uh, net neutrality. So, Great, Dean. I know I speak for all of us. Uh, we appreciate you coming here. University of Michigan, please uh, thank Dean Greco. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. The only way you truly succeed is to say, I want to leverage the efforts of other people. Give them a chance to succeed with you, whether you're talking about within your company or, or you know, think about how Apple